Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College. And I'm here along with my co-host, uh, NASA Community College nursing student, Keith Garbarino. And today, we're talking about how parents can travel safely when they're traveling with infants and young children. Our guest today is Dr. Harvey Karp, best-selling author of the book, Happiest Baby on the Block. Dr. Karp, welcome to your family's health on the voice of NASA Community College 90.3 WHPC. Thanks, Welcome. Janine. It's good to be with you. So first, tell us about yourself and uh, why you became a pediatrician. How how did you choose that path? Um, well, I did my undergrad in Buffalo, New York, actually. I grew up in New York City, but I was interested in biology. And then when I went into medical school, I really lo- I worked in the South Bronx, and I really loved working with kids and families. It was such a, you know, it can be challenging, of course, when a child is ill. That can really, you know, rip your heart apart. But um, but they bounce back, they get better, and helping parents was such a joy for me. So I really found my calling working with, with families with young children. And then I came out to Los Angeles and did a residency at Children's Health of Los Angeles. And uh, it's very seductive out here in California, the, the weather and, the, and the, um, uh, the environment overall. And so I ended up putting down roots, and then I became a, a practicing pediatrician and child developmentalist for over 20 years working with families here in L.A. How much research have you vested in when it comes down to finding the healthiest ways to travel with infants? Well, my my biggest interest is helping children sleep better and cry less and helping parents work with the emotional needs of toddlers. So travel is just a part of that, right? Because when you're traveling, especially with your toddler, you need to keep them focused and cooperating. And, uh, of course, with babies as well, you need to keep them healthy and safe. So the, the travel part of it, I would say, is really just an associated factor of how are you going to be a good parent and be able to take care of young kids, whether it's in your house or when you're out and about. So what is one of the first things a parent should do if they're taking a trip with their baby for the first time? Well, the very first thing is don't. <laughs> oh, don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm only, only half kidding there, but... Uh, one of the things that's important to understand about a baby's um, immune system is that um, they don't fight infections very well in the first three or four months of life. It takes a while for their immune system, for their white blood cell strength, their antibody levels to really get ramped up. And so during those first three months or four months or so, um, if germs get into their bodies, they can kind of take over. And so babies uh, can get, you know, their whole bodies can can start with an illness, but it can take over their whole bodies and babies can get brain infections like meningitis or total body infections like sepsis and bad pneumonia. So you, you hate, I mean, number one, when you're traveling, you're exposing kids to more germs, right? Just, you know, just, you know, opening, closing doors or holding onto a, a handrail. Um, you can pick up germs from the person who was there before you, and then you touch your baby's face and pass it on to them. And so you're more exposed to germs, but also you're also away from your support network. And um, I had one family um, in my practice who was taking a car ride across Arizona, and in the middle of that car ride, in the middle of a, of a nowhere you know, location, the baby developed a fever and ended up having to be hospitalized. And developed meningitis, actually. And the baby did well, but it was a very frightening time for the family. And to be away from their support network and their doctors and the hospitals that they knew was incredibly stressful for them. So what would you say is the best age to travel with a a child? Um, Well, just as, as the first four months is the worst time, probably the next eight months is the best time. Because um, once kids get over nine, ten months, 12 months, 15 months, they don't, they, they have minds of their own, you know, they want to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and keeping them in one place becomes very difficult. So 
then you have all sorts of issues about safety and child-proofing locations when you're traveling. Um, uh, drawers they can pull over on themselves or dressers they can topple or TVs that they can pull over by yanking on the cord or cords from, um, from window blinds or curtains that they can wrap around their neck, electric outlets they can stick a penny into or, or something into to get an electric shock or pull a plug out halfway and touch the prongs and get electric shock or banging their heads on sharp corners. Wow. I mean, yeah. there's all of the things that you worry about in your house, but in your house you've been able to kind of, you know, take care of the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're traveling, you don't have that type of control oftentimes. So what's super cool is between five, six, seven, eight months, you're pretty much still carrying your child all the time in a carrier or a backpack or that kind of thing. So you have you can go anywhere you want to and feed the baby, you know, a pretty controlled diet and um, and not have all of those worries about having to, you know, wrangle them while they're getting into all sorts of mischief. So you're saying eight months or older? No, between... Between four months and eight or nine, ten months before they're really starting to crawl and walk around. I mean, of course, you can travel with them later on. You just have to recognize the fact it's not going to be the way you used to vacation, Mm -hmm. right? Because you have to keep an eye on them at all times, at all times. Uh, Swimming pool injuries, you know, people go to Florida, they go to the Caribbean or, um, or Mexico for a trip, you know, to kind of just take a break. But when you have a young toddler, you... You literally have to have eyes on them or someone has to have eyes on them all the time because they can get so quickly into trouble. It's actually interesting. Have you, do you know about those little leashes that, that yeah, um, people I've seen those. put on? I, yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, they, they, for me, it seems like an eyesore because, you know, just the thought mm-hmm. of having a child. I mean, I understand the concept of it being a parent of four children myself, but when uh-huh. I see the leash on, on a child, it also, it just seems like a leash hmm. and it yeah. seems a little negative, but, um, uh, yeah. it, it does, like it just is a level of safety. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. right. So you might ordinarily not walk your child with a, with a, a leash. <laughs> Having said, that when you're in a situation where you don't have good control and there are risks around you it allows you to give your toddler a little bit of freedom Mm -hmm. and yet not take a risk that they're going to bolt into a street or something like that so that leads me into um another question when it comes down to keeping our infants or children safe which i I guess you suggest the leash and what are some other things that you suggest if you just have to travel with your children infants it's good to to do a few things. Um, one thing is to prepare to, to child-proof the location where you're going to be. So the way the way it's kind of fast and easy to do that is you can bring some electric plugs with you, the little plugs that you put in to close off electric outlets. When you get into the room, you can just spend a half hour kind of scouring the room and literally getting on your hands and knees to see, um, to look for risks. Um, the risk could be little pieces of plastic that are on the carpeting that are chokeable. Yeah. Um, the risk could be sharp corners. It's good when you travel to bring some um, some uh, bandage tape. There's this like paper tape that we use for bandages. You guys are well familiar with that. Yeah. And it's, um, it's super easy to use and it sticks to things easily and you can take it off easily. And if you just bring some paper tape and you can wad up some tissues or some toilet paper, and you can put that over sharp corners, yeah. and boom, boom, right away you've kind of reduced the risk of, I mean, you haven't stopped head bangs, but maybe you've turned something that could lacerate or cut this forehead into something that's just a little bit of a bruise. And other issues, you know, are there any fall um, uh, risk, you know, downstairs, out a window, um, that type of severe problem. So really keeping your eyes open and literally getting on your hands and knees and going all around the location where you've moved to to uh, make sure that you've um, reduced the risk as much as possible. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, along with my student co-host, Keith Garbarino. And today we're talking about traveling with infants with our guest, Dr. Harvey Karp, best-selling author of the book, Happiest Baby on the Block, and founder of the company, Happiest Baby. 
So we're talking about Harvey uh, traveling safely with infants. And I know mm-hmm. that they sell those guards for the corners of desks and the plugs for the electric sockets. So parents or people who are traveling with infants have to come with all of this equipment outside of the diapers and the milk and all that that we mm-hmm. expect to use. They have to have all of the equipment on them you're suggesting before they even think about traveling safely with their right. infants right and that's where a little paper tape and and some tissues kind of help you out because you can you can tape over electric outlets you can put tissues over sharp corners so you don't necessarily have to go out and buy things but you do have to have a little emergency kit and you want an emergency kit for illness too so um you know you should be prepared with Benadryl for an unexpected allergic reaction or Motrin or some type of, um, you know, ibuprofen a medication for the baby having a fever or, or, um, or pain for some reason or another. Um, nose drops maybe because sometimes you go to different places and they're a little dusty and the, and the yeah. baby's nose gets stuffy and then yeah. they have a hard time sleeping. Another thing that's a really good thing to, um, to travel with is white noise. And I don't know, do you guys ever, do you ever use, do you use white noise yourselves for sleep have you ever done that i've slept with it Mm -hmm. can you explain what that is yeah it's kind of a like a humming or think of it like rain on the roof sound you know how people love the sound of rain on the roof um being in a quiet room is we think that that's the most calming and 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 um, kind of sleep encouraging environment but for a lot of people especially when you travel um, you're exposed to all sorts of new sounds. Uh, there are people in the next room. There are people out at the elevator. There are people outside or traffic. And those noises can be very disruptive uh, when you're in a new environment. And especially if it's coupled with new smells. Adults aren't as sensitive to smells as little kids are. But a new scent, a new smell can just feel weird for people, for, for little kids. Um, just the way a pillow you know, that's not your favorite pillow may, may make it hard for you to fall asleep. So it turns out that white noise played kind of like a soft shower sound um, is helpful for, for adults to get better sleep because they're not hearing all these extraneous sounds. And it's helpful for the little kids as well, especially if you use white noise at home. So one of the things I recommend really from birth is that people use white noise to help improve their baby's sleep. Um, inside the womb before the baby is born, the sound of the uterus that baby hears is louder than a vacuum cleaner, 24-7, louder Mm -hmm. than a vacuum cleaner. So to put them in a quiet room in a still bed is actually very weird for babies. Mm -hmm. Um, They're used to constant motion because every time the mother breathes, um, her diaphragm is is rocking the baby back and forth and the sound is louder than a vacuum cleaner. So, So white noise is great to have little kids sleep even when you're at home. Um, but it's especially important when you're traveling so that they're not being disturbed by, by new smells and, and new sounds. And helps the, helps the adults oftentimes sleep better as well. Let's take a quick break. My name is Dr. Janine cook from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, along with my co-host, Keith Garbarino. And today we're talking about traveling with infants with our guest, Dr. Harvey Karp, best-selling author of the book, Happiest Baby on the Block, and founder of the company, Happiest Baby. You're listening to Your Family's Health. From the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. 20 illegal online pharmacies appear each day, but you can find safe and legitimate pharmacies online by looking for dot pharmacy in a web address. Learn more at safe.pharmacy, a public service from the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. We now return to your family's health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. And welcome back to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College. And I'm here with my co-host, Keith Garbarino. And today we're talking about traveling with infants with our guest, Dr. Harvey Karp, best-selling author of the book, Happiest Baby on the Block, and founder of the company's Happiest Baby. So, Harvey, we were talking about traveling with the baby. You claim there are... Five S's to soothe the baby. What are they? Swaddle, side, or stomach position, shush, swing, and suck. Exactly, exactly. So this gets to another issue about traveling with babies or even when you're home with your baby. I mean, the number one stress on new families is sleep. 
And people are exhausted. They're getting postpartum depression. They're having marital fights. They're giving up breastfeeding. And very dangerously, they're bringing their babies in bed with them um, or falling asleep on a sofa or some other unsafe location just because they're so tired. And so it turns out that um, really what the Happiest Baby book, and it, really it's a streaming video, that, that's the main way I recommend people learn this, is that when you imitate the womb experience, you're able to calm a baby and promote sleep. It's kind of like what every grandmother knows, right? I mean, you hold a rocket yeah. fisher baby, the babies sleep better. You go driving in your car for mm -hmm. a colicky baby, that helps them. But it turns out that we can be much more effective at doing that uh, with our, with our uh, babies at home. So swaddling is the first S, snug wrapping with the arms down. We actually have a, um, uh, my company has a, a swaddle blanket called Sleepy, um, and I'm only mentioning it because the New York Times just uh, rated it the number one swaddle blanket in America. Oh, wow. It's safer, easier, faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. So um, we're trying to really help because some people swaddle babies, that, and if they don't know how to do it, it actually becomes a hazard for the baby, and they get loose blankets around their face and whatnot. So it's not just swaddling, but it's safe swaddling. That's important. And they like to be the, swaddled snugly. Really snugly, yeah. with the arms down, yeah. which you would hate. But you wouldn't want to live in a uterus for nine months. You know what no. I, mean? I mean, most of us wouldn't. But babies and love so, it. Exactly. <laughs> so they need that type of confinement. Yeah. Side stomach is the best position for calming mm -hmm. a crying baby. Never for sleep. The back is the only safe position for sleep. Mm -hmm. But the side or stomach is the best position for when they're crying to settle them. Um, the third S is shushing. That's the white noise we were talking about. Um, the fourth S is swinging or rhythmic motion. And the fifth is sucking, which is kind of like the icing on the cake. And so when parents, it turns out that, that just doing these things isn't enough. There's a right way and a wrong way to do the sound, the motion. Um, and it kind of depends on how upset the baby is. You do a little more jiggling, a little louder shushing when the baby gets upset. Um, you kind of know this intuitively when you're a nurse, but when you're a young parent and you haven't taken care of a lot of babies, sometimes it doesn't seem right or, or normal. And so, um, in fact, one of the interesting things in terms of traveling with babies and sleep is that we now have a new uh, type of a baby bed called SNU, which is a, a caregiving bed. I love that the public service announcement about caregiving. Um, but parents today are, um, are doing something that no parent ever did in the history of humanity. I know that that sounds odd. But when you think about it, forever, for thousands of years, up until the last hundred years, you, you always live with your extended family. The village took care of the child. Yeah. So you had your mother, your sister, your aunt, your next door neighbor's older daughter. <clears throat> you had all those people helping you. Today, if you have a nanny or a night nurse, you're really well off. Yeah. But you should have five nannies, your extended family. And so that becomes super important for taking care of a baby. So we created this bed with the help of leading engineers and designers and the bed rocks and trishes babies all night long so it does the five s's for the baby all night and it secures the baby on the back mm. so for the first time ever we have a bed that prevents babies from rolling to an unsafe position when the baby fusses the bed responds with a little bit more rocking and trishing to calm the baby down that's why it's like a caregiver because it actually responds to the baby in the middle of the night to help improve the baby's sleep and reduce crying so I'm sorry. So when it comes down to um, you said the sucking, um, w w are we giving them a pacifier, or are you suggesting uh, for the nursing mothers that the sucking um, n nursing a baby would be more appropriate? What what are we using in terms of the sucking? Yeah, it's all of the above mm -hmm. and bottles. So if it's not a breastfed baby. The bottle is part of the sucking um, satisfaction they get. Mm -hmm. Of course, breastfeeding, we recommend, you know, eight to ten times a day. So that's a lot of sucking yeah. um, stimulation, too. But some babies, they're like sucking maniacs. They just, that, that is how they soothe themselves. Mm -hmm. And so um, at a certain point, pacifiers are a great tool. We like to avoid them for the first couple of weeks to really get breastfeeding established well. But once breastfeeding is going well, then, then that's the time to introduce the pacifier. So when we're talking about the babies who may vomit during their sleep, you're saying lay them on the back. What are the thoughts about uh, that in terms of, you know, choking? Well, actually, we used to think that was a risk. Uh, and then in the 1990s, we started putting babies on the back. 
I mean, <laughs> I'm old enough to know that there was a time when I was telling people only let the baby sleep on the stomach. And then in the 1990s, we learned that that was a higher risk for infant sleep death. Right. And we recommended only on the back. We thought babies would vomit and choke, but it turns out they don't. Mm -hmm. They just turn their heads to the side and the vomit comes out the side of their mouth. So over the last 20 years, 25 years, since we've been only doing back sleeping, we, we, we rarely, if ever, it's almost unheard of to hear of a baby choking on their own vomit. Um, what, what's more of the risk is that the baby is going to roll from the back to yes. the stomach. That becomes the risk. And when babies always sleep on their back, then they roll to the stomach. They don't know what to do with their faces. Mm -hmm. And so we recommend that families practice tummy time, which is putting a little baby on the stomach and letting them practice pushing up and lifting their heads. Sort and, of just strengthening um, the, the, strength the musculature. Strengthening it and teaching them what they need to do, helping them learn the motor skill to be able to lift the head up. So strength and skill building. Um, having said that, um, it's unpredictable when babies are going to roll over. It could be at one month or two months or three months, which kind of makes you a little paranoid as a parent because once they roll over, they dramatically increase their risk of having a breathing problem. Yeah. Um, and so we're excited with, um, with Snoo because since the swaddle blanket attaches to the bed, oh. once the baby is in the bed, they cannot roll to an unsafe position. Oh, so great. we just won the National Sleep Foundation's Innovation of the Year Award because not only do we add an extra hour or two to a baby's sleep, but we prevent babies from accidentally rolling over. So we give parents that extra peace of mind as well. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHBC. My name is Dr. Janine Kukarad from the nursing department here at NASA Community College along with my co-host, Keith Garbarino. And today we're talking about traveling with infants without guests. Dr. Harvey Karp, best-selling author of the book, Happiest Baby on the Block, and founder of the company Happiest Baby. Harvey, to switch up a little bit, what are the best vacation destinations to go with um, a traveling infant? If you're doing it between 4 and 12 months of age, when you've got control, you know, you can, obviously, you, you want to go someplace where you, you know you're going to have a good medical care in case any problem does come up. But you can travel adult places. You can do things that you want to do, like it might be museums or traveling interesting places, knowing that you can carry your infant in an in a infant carrier and, and keep them happy. Yeah. Once they're over a year, then you really have to kind of be more, um, I think, traditional in your, in your traveling. So it's usually people go to family places, um, visiting uh, their relatives, and going to, going to vacation places, certainly during those the, the years between one and, and one and three or four, where you have a swimming pool or a beach or something that's fun and entertaining for the child. Once they get over that age, of course, you know, the, uh, the, the entertainment destinations like a Disney World or Disneyland become more interesting for the little kids or a Knott's Berry Farm. Um, but um, when you take a trip with a little kid, it's really all about them. Actually, I so appreciate you mentioned Happiest Baby on the Block. There's also a book called Happiest Toddler on the Block, which teaches a new approach to kids eight months to five years of age to help reduce outburst behavior and get more cooperation. Those skills are really important when you're traveling because when you're in a new environment, your child may be more, um, you know, more likely to act up, may be more stressed, more tired out of their environment. And so they may need, ex you may need you to have extra good communication skills to reduce their anxiety or their stress. Another thing that you can do, you mentioned uh, pacifiers, but uh, loveys, you know, teddy bears and security blankets. Um, for a lot of kids, that little, just like adults sometimes travel with their own pillow, uh, it helps for toddlers to sometimes have something that's very familiar for them yeah. to carry around with them as mm -hmm. well. Just don't leave it in the hotel room. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's a big tragedy. I'm telling yeah. you. The, the amount of information on babies and toddlers is astronomical. So let's switch gears and talk about the health of a new parent. Talk about the effects of sleep deprivation that it has on them. Yeah, we constantly are looking, uh, watching the baby and have to watch what they're doing and where they're going. How about the sleep of that parent? Yeah. Yeah, my God, that's such a great question, yeah. and it's so important. We're so focusing on keeping those babies healthy, but, of course, it's kind of like when you're in the airplane, right? They tell you, take the oxygen yeah. mask yourself first. 
you got to take care of yourself. And uh, as I mentioned, sleep deprivation is rampant among new parents. Um, and people think it's the norm. And people think, well, that's just what you have to do, suck it up and deal with it. But the fact of the matter is, like I said earlier, you're supposed to have help. You're supposed to have people, you know, that you can pass the baby off to and take a nap. Uh, these days, if you were to, if you were to hire a 14 year old teenager to come in for one hour, you'd have to pay 20 bucks for that probably or more. Um, and so, um, parents need that extra help and support. One of the things we're doing, um, uh, with, um, with SNU, with the bed I mentioned before, is now parents can rent the bed for just about $3 a day, which is pretty much what you're spending on coffee or Red Bull just to stay awake. Um, you can get the safest, most effective baby bed. And even corporations are renting it as a benefit now. So Google, Facebook, News Corp, Weight Watchers, uh, Under Armour, many, many corporations provide these beds for their employees. And this gets to your question about parent health, because if you're not sleeping well, you have a higher risk for depression, anxiety, car accidents, um, obesity, because you're overeating and you're not exercising, cigarette smoking, because you're extra stressed and you go back to your old habits. And so it turns out that quite unexpectedly, crying babies and exhausted parents literally cost billions of dollars in healthcare costs and billions of dollars of employer costs. Um, a third of women, when they have their new baby, don't return to work for another year. That's very impactful, especially in the nursing profession. There's so many young men and women who have babies and, and then they, they get torn. They feel like I cannot dedicate myself to nursing because I have to dedicate myself to my baby this next year or two. And so having a helper like a SNU that can help be a caregiver and, and add an extra hour or two to a baby's sleep turns out to be a fantastic opportunity for families for really what they're spending already on on coffee or Red Bull yeah. just to stay awake with the baby. So when you're talking about uh, new parents out there, um, if one of our friends are listening and they wanted to get in touch with you, tell us the website that they're able to access all of the information about the book and your mm -hmm. business. Yeah, they can learn all about this at uh, the happy at happiestbaby.com. I tried to get happiestbaby.com, C A L M. <laughs> okay. I wasn't, wasn't able to get that, <laughs> but happiestbaby.com. So thank you so much for being with us today. A lot of information for new parents out there. Uh, Dr. Harvey, best selling author of the book Happiest Baby on the Block and founder of the company Happiest Baby. This is Dr. Janine Cookerrod from the nursing department here at NASA Community college along with my co-host keith garbarino and we want to thank you our listening audience for tuning in to this week's edition of your family's health we'd like to get your feedback on your family's health send your comments by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu podcasts of today's show are available on itunes android podcasts and spreaker this program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.